Hello everyone and welcome to another video with me 320 Simpilot. Today we are back in the A320 Neo in Microsoft Flight Simulator looking at another highly questioned feature which is the timings and the clocks and what do we use them for and why am I constantly pressing that little chrono button to start the timer. You'd think in a sophisticated aircraft like the Airbus that having to use stopwatches seems like a, a bit of a thing of the past and why are we doing it. So today I'm going to run through what we use them for and why I'm, I'm doing that in my streams and flights and why I do it in real life. This is something that Airbus pilots do every day all over the world all the time. As ever I am a real world Airbus pilot but none of this is for any real world use. It's just to give you some extra context on your home simulations. We are of course using the Fly-by-Wire A32NX mod for Microsoft Flight Simulator and we'll be starting here in Lisbon, Portugal as we set off on this flight up towards uh, London. Let's get started. Here we are on the flight deck now. I'm just going to get rid of the jet bridge and call up the tug. So we'll close the front door. Goodbye. Call the tug. Right, so we're getting ready for pushback here. The aircraft, as you can see, is pretty much ready to go. We just got the APU getting started. We can get rid of ground power shortly after that. But the fuel's on, the performance is done. We've got all our FMAs as we want them. We've got the stop altitude. We're going to climb up to 6,000 feet initially. And let's just make sure the QNH is correct. It did just change. Great. And the MCDUs are all loaded up. So what am I going to be talking about today? Well, uh, I'm talking about the timings. The first timing um, is actually something that's quite a recent addition to the Airbus. After the APU has started, which I've just done, I'm going to start the clock. And this is now a normal thing to do. Didn't used to be. Uh, and what we're doing here is we're just letting the APU warm up to its, its normal operating temperatures. It helps with the seals around the, the APU. And obviously it is a jet engine, but crucially, there is a huge demand on the APU when we start pumping in air. For those of you who don't know, the APU is the auxiliary power unit. It's a little jet in the tail of the aircraft, which you can hear and now see blasting out the back there. So this is uh, what I'm talking about, and it's a little jet engine, and we use it for ground power so it can provide us with electricity it has a generator and also bleed air bleed air is air that we take from this jet and we can pump it into the cabin as air conditioned air which is how we get ventilation through the cabin on the ground and we also use it to start the engines by pumping air into the engines to spin them around and that way we can start them up that looks like an expensive mistake over there oh dear <laughs> so what we're doing now is we're going to time we're going to let the apu warm up for three minutes before we turn on the apu bleed the reason is if you look at that exhaust gas temperature, that's the temperature of the air coming out the back of the APU, it's currently 340 degrees Celsius, it's going to rise a lot. It's a substantial increase in demand. It takes a lot of fuel um, on the APU to run the bleed air. It's, it's an incredibly demanding thing because you're taking air out of a jet engine and it wants to use it for spinning itself around and we're taking it away so it has to pump in more fuel to suck in more air so it can provide us with that. Uh, hence the, the rise in temperatures. So when that time is done, uh, we can move on to the next one. It's worth noting you only have to do this when the APU is cold. Now, that doesn't mean just because you've been flying it's warm, because of course if we sit in the cruise for three hours at minus 50 degrees Celsius, the APU will be very cold. But if you've run the APU on the way in, uh, it would therefore be warm, and then if you've just turned it off and then you're going to restart it again, it's likely that it's going to be sitting at a, a more normal temperature. But there's our three minutes. Let's turn on the APU bleed. And we should see a rise in EGT. And lo and behold, as ever, the fly-by-wire team doing a fantastic job. And up goes the EGT. It's hard to believe that without them, we wouldn't even have this ABU page working. So amazing, as ever. So yeah, increase in the EGT there, as you would expect. We'll get rid of the APU page. So some basics about using the chrono. It's quite simple. We press the button once to turn it on. And it starts timing immediately, showing us minutes and seconds. If we press it again, it will stop and it will go to wherever we last had it. So there you go, we got to six seconds and we press it once more to reset it. And that's all it does. It can't do anything else. It's not clever th cleverer than that. It doesn't tie into any other systems. That's all it is. It's just a clock that displays on our navigation display. Each pilot gets one, of course. There is another for the FO on the navigation display over there. So there we go. That's the first uh, use for it. The next little clock we're going to use is this one down here. Now this one is a bit more important. This is related to the workings of the aircraft. So this aircraft, the Airbus, does need to know what time it is. Or oh, you can see our yellow accumulator pressures down. Interesting. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so 1419 down here matches 1419 up here. And you can see it's set to GPS. There was a time when this wouldn't be. It would be run on internal. And there were Airbus aircraft that didn't have a GPS. But now we usually set that to GPS. This synchronizes it to the time coming from GPS satellites. Now, the aircraft can have its own internal time and we can tell it a time as well. It is possible, but that's a, a failure sort of situation and, and quite complex and boring. But there it is. 
GPS is used because GPS satellites have the most accurate time you're going to get and they transmit it. So your GPS at home will most likely provide you with the most accurate time you can get. So that's what that's what the aircraft will be using. You can press this to see the date. So there you go. It is indeed the 12th of September. Um, so uh, 21. So there you go. Pretty, pretty obvious. Uh, we also have another chrono up here, which we can start. And this is a nice backup. If the pilots are using theirs, you could use this for something bigger or something that both pilots need to see. Let's say we've had a problem and we want to just set a time before we recheck the fuel. Then you could use this clock instead. And therefore, both pilots have easy access to it. Same system. You press chrono again, but you reset with a separate button. The magic of that is, of course, that I can pause it at two seconds, wait a bit, and then I can press it again and it will carry on. So slightly more functional. So when we push back, and uh, let me just get the aircraft ready for pushback. Again, this is not a pushback tutorial. We're not doing things uh, too properly here. We'll get rid of the ground power. Um, but what we're going to do is go to auto, positive to idle, great. So I'm going to release the brake and we're going to push back. And as soon as we release the brake, we'll set that to run. So what I did there was the lower, the lower little clock here is it stop, reset, you move it up to run. That's now running in hours and minutes. It doesn't show us seconds. Very important. So it's only going to show us hours and minutes. So it's used for longer sort of duration things. Most airlines will use that for this purpose, which is a pushback. You're going to start, start it. We do it at brakes released because that's when we count the block hours of aircraft in Europe. It may be different worldwide as ever. You know, this is only based on my experience and these things will change around the world. I think that'll do there before we go too far. So yeah, now we're gonna leave that running for the whole sector. So why do we start it there? Well, aircraft maintenance relies on us timing how long we spend uh, making the aircraft work. For example, um, running the engines, driving it around on the ground and so on. So we will log block hours, they're called. So we don't just log the time the aircraft is in the air. We actually log the time the aircraft is moving under its own power and all sorts. And again, this varies around the world. But for us in Europe, that typically means we're going to log the time that it's pushed back and, and therefore we are moving the aircraft around uh, in the, with the intention of going flying. So there we go. We have been running for one minute. So this is useful for crew to judge how long you've been taxiing, things like that. Um, but it can also be useful in case uh, our ACAR system doesn't record properly. The aircraft will happily record takeoff times, landing times and all sorts and send it off to the company, depending on which airline you're in. But that system can fail or you might lose signal or the, you could lose both uh, FMGCs would be another example where you, the aircraft no longer remembers what time it took off. Uh, and it still flies perfectly fine like that. But when we want to record it in the tech log, it's useful to have had a, a record here of how long the aircraft was in, in motion it, with, with the in the mission, as it were. So that's why we'll leave this one running. It's totally separate. It will run on its own. It's, it's very good. So that one left running by most crews. Here we go then. Parking brake is set. It's time to start up those engines. And now we're going to talk about the next uh, the next set of timings we're going to have to need. So the clock we're going to use next is back to the uh, good old chrono. This is the one we're going to use mostly now because this, this timer here is just left running. What I'm going to do is time the engine start. Now this is not actually required for an automatic engine start, which 99.99% of engine starts are. An automatic engine start is when we do quite obvious we move this to ignition start and then we put a master switch on that is a normal start procedure the aircraft has fadex system which is full authority digital engine control so it's going to control the start and if it senses a failure or a problem it can actually shut off the start itself or retry all on its own without us doing anything if it has anything for us to do it'll ping us and give us an ecam instruction now a lot of that won't be modeled here this isn't a failure simulation as of yet but those are um, some things that we need to be keeping in mind when we start up the engines that the the FADEC is in in charge effectively there are a couple of extreme scenarios where we would turn off the engine ourselves i will only talk about those in a, another more focused video on engine starts so do we need to time the engine start i nearly always do i do in the real world do i need to officially uh, as far as i can tell no although some people may disagree some airlines may have different sops and it could be a, a variation over time and that rule may change or it may have changed from the past but the FADEC is timing the engine start and it runs itself according to that. So me timing doesn't really change much because I won't shut down the engine unless FADEC tells me to anyway. So what do I start the timer for? Well, it gives me an awareness. In the older style aircraft, the CEO, so not using these engines, we are in a NEO today, of course, but in the older aircraft, um, it 
would always start with the same sort of sequence. There's a similar time, about 30 seconds on the IAE, engine, IAE engines where it would uh, motor around. In the CFM engines, it was even shorter. It didn't motor for so long, and then it would start up the engines. Um, so they'd spin around for a little bit first. In the Neos, that time frame is actually a, a lot different. If they're hot, they'll actually motor for quite a long time. They can spin around for just about a minute sometimes, um, but it's all decided by the computers. So again, me timing is, is largely pointless, but there is one crucial bit that I do like to time, and I'll show you what that is. So let's start engine number two. We normally start engine two first because it powers the yellow hydraulic system. So uh, yeah, we should have that should actually we should have fixed that already. We should have had the accumulator already online. Um, Watch my hydraulic video if you'd like to hear more about that. And I'm going to start the timer, which I should have done already. But no matter, because the engine is starting up. And the bit I'm going to time, or I'm especially interested in, is when I see fuel flow and EGT. So there is a time limit on this. Um, and there it goes. Fuel flow and EGT almost uh, identical. Um, so up they go. Now, if we hadn't had an EGT rise after the fuel starts flowing, then I would be concerned. So what I'm doing, effectively, all I'm timing, very long way of saying something quite simple, which is I, I need a certain time after the fuel starts flowing into the engine uh, that I need to see an EGT. The reason is fuel's flowing into the engine, so I need to know it's being ignited and burnt, which we can tell by seeing an exhaust gas temperature rise. If fuel's going into the engine and there's no exhaust gas temperature rise, it means the fuel is just flowing into the engine and it's sitting there, and now we're at risk of a fire. So we don't want that to last for long. So that's why we have that important uh, timer. But that's for me, it's an awareness thing. And I, I, I can't say, you, I can't sit here and tell you, you definitely need to do it. It doesn't really play too much of an influence on things. Um, so for the Neo, it's quite important that 15 seconds after we have that fuel flow, we should see an EGT rise. It was, it was 20 seconds on the older aircraft. And we're also looking for an N2 increase as well at that point. So the N2 down here. So let's start up the next engine and try that again. So I would restart my clock. Oh, there we go, already restarted. And let's start up engine number one. So put that on, start the clock. Now there is another useful thing. If I'm sitting here and I see this go for one and a half minutes um, and more, <laughs> and then I would start to realize there's obviously something going on with the engine. So it gives me awareness of where we are or where I would expect to be in the startup. But again, big differences between the older engines and the newer engines. So it makes it quite tricky to judge. So fuel flow, EGT, only about two seconds. But as I said, 15 seconds we need and N2 is rising as well. Now these were automatic starts, but there are manual engine starts, which will require timing. The reason is we have to be very aware because they are manual engine starts are a way of sort of overriding the FADEX system. So why might we do that? That would be if we need to start the engines in difficult conditions, strong tailwinds, high altitude, or we've had unsuccessful starts for various reasons. And there are some MEL items where we would need to do a manual engine start. For example, if one of the igniter systems was offline. Now that is again, all gonna have to be part of a separate startup video because there is a lot to talk about with that. But that's why I start the, the clock for this little section. I'm just checking that the engines go in their normal sort of sequence and it could give me an earlier clue if they aren't, which will just make me sure that I'm focused in the right part of the, the aircraft. Once the engine starts, and that ends by the way when it says avail, that's the end of the start sequence, I'm gonna reset my timer and then I'm gonna start it again. And <laughs> we're now onto our next timer. Uh, now I'm checking the engine warms up properly. This is very simple. This is the easiest one of all. Three minutes in a Neo aircraft, three minutes. I'm talking about the Leap Neo here, by the way, because of course we are flying the Leap Neo in Microsoft Flight Simulator. It's a three minute timer. During that time, I need the engines to run at or near idle. Taxi time is included in that. And what we're doing is we're letting them thermally stabilize before we try and take off. Now, in the older aircraft, the CEO aircraft, not the Neo, in the older aircraft, this time limit was quite complicated. It used to be uh, five minutes if the engines were cold or two minutes if they were warm. Uh, the reason for that two minutes is because we are actually, if we have fuel in the center tank, which we don't today, but if you did, it would do a self-test at this point, which takes two minutes. We're not allowed to take off using fuel from the center tanks, so we can't take off for that first two minutes after the second engine has been started. And that's another important point. This time, of course, has to start after the second engine is started, not the first engine. So we mustn't take off using the center tanks. Therefore, we must not take off within two minutes of the second engine start. On the Neo, we have to warm the engines for three minutes anyway, so that's never an issue. On the older aircraft, the CEO, we had to warm the engines for five minutes if they were cold, cold meaning that they were run for, uh, haven't been run for two hours or more. 
but if they were warm, so they had been run within the last two hours, we could actually just pretty much go and take off. It wasn't such an issue. So therefore, we had a two-minute limit because we had to make sure those those fuel, uh, the fuel center fuel pumps were no longer providing us with our fuel, and we we're back to running on the wing tanks. Very complicated, I know. If you're flying the Neo in Microsoft Flight Simulator, three minutes, three minutes from second engine start in all circumstances. Well, it doesn't matter, warm or cold, it's three minutes, which will fortunately solve the uh, the fuel tank issue on its own. Out at the runway now then, uh, I can only apologize that I can't get the auto brake to arm correctly. Something between the fly by wire and my Thrustmaster add-on set is not quite talking properly. It does appear, but I think, oh, maybe we've got it. Okay, great. So we're out of the runway now, ready to go. And look, we've had seven minutes, plenty of time. A normal taxi, three, three minutes is very easy. You'd have no trouble getting an engine warmed up for three minutes on a normal taxi. The five minute one took a bit of planning. If you're especially using single engine taxi, you needed to make sure you, you were giving the engine enough time. But in a Neo, three minutes, no problem at all. More of the issue is if you're doing single engine taxi in a Neo is that it can take quite a while to start. But at the moment in Microsoft Flight Simulator, it always seems to start as if it's cold, i.e. the quickest startup time. But there we go. So we're out at the runway, we are ready to go. Let's get the TCAS on to TARA, get all those lights on and get ourselves uh, get ourselves out there so we can approach. So now we're coming to the most obvious timer, the one that I use every stream. I've done it every takeoff, and it is actually SOP. So this one is not optional. This is what we need to do. Now, it would normally be done by pilot monitoring, but when we go to takeoff, what we're going to do, and we'll do it ourselves, is we're going to start the chrono just as we're setting takeoff thrust. What's the reason for that? And this is the question I've been asked a lot, and I can completely understand why. Well, we need to time how long we've been running the engines at takeoff thrust because there is a limitation on it. That limitation is, dun dun dun, it's going to be five minutes. Five minutes at takeoff thrust. Why is there a limitation like that? You're going to have to speak to Airbus or some engineers, but it's mainly to do with engines can't run at high thrust settings forever. They can run at uh, certain settings for a long time, but high thrust, takeoff thrust, is not designed for, for long term use. So we can run at takeoff thrust for five minutes whilst both engines are operating. So why do I say five minutes while both engines are operating? Because if we have an engine failure during takeoff, I'm then allowed to run the remaining engine for actually 10 minutes. So that timer will be really useful because if I've taken off um, and I have an engine failure during the takeoff roll and we get into the air and I'm worried because I've been sitting there for a long time on this one engine still at takeoff thrust trying to get through the engine failure after takeoff procedure, um, if it's taking a long time, I can check my timer and it will tell me how far I've had. So either it will say five minutes and then I'll know I need to, if I'm still on two engines, I need to bring them back. Or if I'm at 10 minutes and I'm on single engine, then that's that's my time limit on it. Now, that is a quite extreme scenario. Uh, engine failure procedures normally make sure there is pretty much no chance of you sitting there for 10 minutes on one engine at takeoff thrust. It's not, not ideal, but there we go. If you need help with engine failures at takeoff or after takeoff, it's called, uh, I've got a video all about it when you have an engine failure on the runway and you need to get into the air on just one engine. It's one of the most critical safety maneuvers that we learn and we train it every time we're in the sim where we are practicing that again. And it's assessed uh, every year as well to make sure we can still do it. Because of course it could happen on any takeoff, although incredibly unlikely, incredibly, incredibly rare, but it is the worst part of the flight to have an engine failure. Anyway, so what I'm gonna do is set my takeoff thrust. So we go 50% initially, I'm gonna start my timer as I said, normally done by pilot monitoring because the pilot flying will have their hands busy at this point. Then we're going to release the brakes and we'll just go for a normal takeoff. So there's nothing too exciting about this, but that timer now, as you'll remember, is running specifically for five minutes. That's it. Let's go. Man, Flex 55, SRS, runway, auto thrust is armed and blue. As we pass through 80 knots, side stick to neutral. So the timer's no good on the runway here. It's not doing anything for us. V1, rotate, up we go. Positive climb, gear coming up. Into nav mode. So the normal time to be running at takeoff thrust is now, <laughs> up until we get to our thrust reduction altitude. Just gonna put it all apart at one. 
By default, that's often 1,000 feet above the runway. Sometimes it's 1,500 feet above the runway. It's something like that. And you'll see on two engines, lo and behold, we're already 1,000 feet above the runway. And any second now will be 1,500 feet above the runway. There we go. Radio altimeter showing me that. And then we go lever climb. We're now bringing that thrust back. Something to notice, I've used the reduced thrust takeoff, flex 55. So sometimes the takeoff thrust will be very similar to the climb thrust. So it does, it's not actually making a massive difference. But there we go. How long did that take us? Less than less than two minutes easily. Just back one click. There we go. Thrust climb order thrust. Basically no change on the uh, N1 because it's essentially the same thing in, in modern aircraft. They can derate so much that we don't actually need to use all that extra thrust for the takeoff. Um, but say we'd take off, taken off in toga thrust that limitation would still apply so we, there's a big difference between toga and climb thrust so that's why it's there i often leave the timer running now until we've done a few other things crucially flaps up on some departures maybe we had a speed limit of 190 knots that is possible if that was the case on my departure then i'd want to make sure that i don't forget something silly like the flaps now the flaps are a bit hard to forget because you've got the speed take limit up here but there's also the gear and the Airbus won't remind us now. You'll see that this ECAM memo has disappeared. It, it, we're not in takeoff mode anymore. We're into the climb phase and we can see that if we go to performance, it's gone to climb phase. So something really daft to do would be to forget the gear. Let's so put the gear out. Oh, I'll do it like that. You'll now see that pretty much nothing changes. I'll just give it a second. Now there's extra noise. It would be very noisy and there's drag. But if you look around the flight deck, aside from hearing it, you can't really tell. There's no sign. Uh, the wheel page coming up could be a clue. There's lots of clues, but there's no direct big red thing telling us the gear's down. It's just these three little lights up here, which in the you know, bright sunshine could be a bit um, hard to see. So the very rare occasions where the gear may have been left down for longer, perhaps for distraction, perhaps because of brake cooling if you're allowed to use that procedure some airlines don't like it but there's a few different reasons so i like to leave the timer running until i know gear and flaps are all up and in things that aren't particularly monitored by the ecam so let's bring that up maximum speed limit on retracting the gear 220 knots that's written up here uh, retraction 220 220 because that nose gear moves forward into the airflow so it's pretty obvious right and now say the speed limit ends at this point we can go to manage speed once the aircraft is accelerating and above the green S, we can go flaps to zero. Disarm ground spoilers. And get rid of those nose gear lights. And now I'm going to stop my chrono because I'm satisfied. Everything's done. Um, and then we'll go into our checklist. If, uh, if you have a checklist at this point, it depends on the airline. So there we go. Some people will leave that chrono running from takeoff for the whole flight for a similar reason to this one um, in that it gives you a good idea of how long everything's taking. But I don't tend to do that. I tend to turn it off. Um, at this point and then use it for other things if I need it sometimes to if I had some reminder I wanted to set myself although you can do that in the MCDU as well if you're being clever but there are a few other uses uh, another thing to note is there is a time limit on the single engine if you had to then go around later on in the flight but again that's a failure situation so those are the normal uses for the time limits so just to recap we're going to use the timer to start running the main clock when we push back we're going to time for three minutes for the APU to warm up. We're going to time for the engine start because we want to see uh, an EGT rise after fuel flow goes in. We're going to time after the second engine start to check the engines have warmed up before takeoff. And we're going to time the takeoff thrust set. So we need to make sure that we don't run that for more than five minutes when we have two engines or 10 minutes if we lose an engine and we're down to one engine. It's sort of a special situation. So that's all for today's video. I hope it's been interesting for you. Just one of those little uh, bits of trivia that people have been asking about and I thought it would make quite a nice video. If you have any questions, do please put them in the comments uh, and there'll be plenty more guides on the Airbus coming to the channel soon as well as live streams. So do please subscribe if you'd like to see more of those. I have been quite busy lately, unusually busy uh, this last few weeks. So that uh, will, will return to normal sort of service uh, as we move into October. Uh, but there's been a few life events as well as uh, a bit more work, which has been good news. Thank you all very much for watching and we'll see you again in another of those videos or live streams soon. Bye bye.